You find yourself at the foot of a snowy mountain. Your purpose is clear. You have set out on your first great adventure, a quest of great importance. You see, at the top of this mountain sits an ancient white dragon that has been terrorizing the countryside for months, and you and your compatriots have taken it upon yourselves to slay it once and for all. The people on either side of you make up your adventuring party, each of you with a specific set of skills tailored to fit any situation. The snow beneath your feet is firm, and the wind howling through the valleys cuts you to the bone. How are you going to make it to the peak? Will you dare to venture into the ice caverns that wind their way up the interior of the mountain? Will you break out your shiny new climbing gear and try and scale the side of the rocky slope? Or will you try to lure the dragon down from its perch so you can fight it on the ground and on your own terms? You find yourself at the foot of a, a mountain, but this mountain is not of stone and snow. This mountain is of metal. The glass panes flicker in your eyes. There's not a dragon at the top of this mountain, but the CEO. You have a group presentation coming up. You know you can do this. You've conquered trolls and troglodytes alike. How do you want to do this? Will you use Times New Roman or Comic Sans for your presentation? We, I think we used Helvectica. Now, we understand that this might sound a little bit ridiculous, but we promise that there is a connection between a world where adventurers are scaling a mountain to slay an ancient dragon and a world where you are nervous about giving a presentation to your boss. I want you to think for a second about all the practical skills that co come into play in each of these scenarios. In order to slay the dragon, you're going to have to be able to communicate with your team to survive the frigid encounters with the dragon cultists. You're going to need to be able to negotiate your way past the greedy cave troll that is guarding the entrance to the dragon's lair. Ultimately, you're going to be need to be able to identify the strengths of your team and play to them in the correct situations to find the greatest chance of success. You are going to have your chance to shine, and you're going to help your friends find theirs. Similarly, in the quest to get the group presentation done, you need to work with your team. What strengths will you highlight that is someone better at making bar graphs? Because I'm not. Are there weaknesses that need to be mitigated as a team? Both of these scenarios, the dragon and the group presentation, are designed to challenge you as your time as an, uh, as an adventurer or a person. And we at the Bards College uh, hope to help foster those skills with our program. Good afternoon. My name is Calder Schweitzer. But to my friends, I am Drake Owlbear, Barnabas Drax, Refrigerator, Racer Scars, Marilina McCracken, the Gnomish Druid. I've been adventuring for a year and a half, and I've been a dungeon master for a year. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nolan Wadsworth, and to my friends, sometimes I am Vasaris Cartwright, the, the half-war crime lord who rules with an iron fist. Sometimes I'm Lady Elise Eltonson, a wizard, a court wizard in a sleepy town long past its prime. In a world without dragons, I am the other co-founder of the Bard's College, and I've been a dungeon master for three years now. So tonight, as your dungeon masters, we welcome you to the fantastical. <laughs> um, so we represent the Bards College, uh, a nonprofit uh, set right here in Guelph that uses tabletop role-playing games to help young adults uh, become socially intelligent. Um, so we get it. Tabletop role-playings might be a little weird. Like it's it's a new thing for you. So let me give you a little background. So it started off in, with war games uh, set during major conflicts in isolated scenarios. Players would be assigned different roles in a combat zone. Some would be the general, some would be the local priest or the mayor in a town, and they would all have a goal and a narrative. The premise has shifted since, uh, but the foundation remains the same. Friends sitting around a table, engaging in a story together. So our story begins not unlike that. The legends of yore, Gary Gygax and D Dave Arneson, sat around a table and found a way to implement their favorite fantasy lore with the mechanics of a war, war game, and thus Dungeons and Dragons was born. Now there's been a resurgence in the popularity of these types of games since the release of Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. 5th edition is the easiest of them to learn, and that makes it perfect for our program, because you see 5th edition is by nature a game of bricks. Before you even get to the table and start role-playing, you have to create your character. This is the person, the character, that you are going to be controlling for the entirety of your adventure, or unless their life is tragically cut short. Um, 
the character creation method gives you a series of bricks to choose from that you can arrange in any way you see fit to create something. For example, you start off by choosing a race. Will you be a strong, stubborn dwarf? How about a elegant and dexterous elf? A versatile and learned human? Or perhaps some socially misunderstood tiefling? <laughs> what class are you gonna be? Are you gonna be a stalwart fighter? A magical wizard? A nefarious rogue? Or a sinister warlock? Then think about how was your character raised? Are they a priest? A sailor? A soldier? Or are they a hermit? Did they grow up in a monastery learning the art of hand-to-hand -hand combat? Did they work as a field healer in the Great War? Or maybe they're just a dorky kid from a small town looking to make their way in the world and prove themselves to somebody. All of these bricks that you put together will create your character, and in turn that character will act as a brick of itself, which will be taken by your dungeon master and used to lay the foundation of a grand story that you will tell together, your campaign. So we've kind of examined how the, the, the process of creating character is brick by brick. Uh, everything kind of forms together into the structure. But we're going to take a step back. We've gained, we've gained a level now. We've learned a few things. We're going to take a step back and look at the mechanics of the game. The foundation of Dungeons & Dragons is built upon three bricks. Combat, exploration, and social interaction. Each of these challenge the player in unique and different ways. Some will have to, some are more expert in combat. Some are the trackers, and others are the bards who t do all the talking. <laughs> now, our program with the Bards College is focused specifically on the latter of these three social interaction. See, as the dungeon masters of the program, we can engineer situations for our players to go through that will allow them avenues to practice certain skills. For example, if we get our players together and we say, all right, we want you to practice speaking with people, interacting with the public. We may say, okay, you stand in the town square. Nearby, you know there's an ancient ruin shrouded in mystery. Inside, rumors of a great treasure mill around the town. You must speak with the locals and gather as much information as you can, for you see nobody has ever returned from that ruin, and you want to make sure you're as prepared as possible for what you're going to face. And then later on, if we think, okay, we, they've gotten some practice social interaction, let's, let's focus on teamwork now. We can say, yes, you've made it through the ruin, you've defeated the boss, and your treasure is secured in your bag of holding. But all of a sudden, all of the doors to the main chamber seal. You feel the ground start to rumble, and the ruin begins to collapse around you. Now, we face them with a puzzle, where they have to work together and interact so that they may escape with their lives. So... Uh, we, we, we've seen how like, the mechanics of the game and the character building all kind of coalesce into this brick-like structure. Um, other things that might add to it are magical items, a staff of bird calling that just makes bird noises. It's pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> important non-player to characters, like Fasaris Cartwright, who I mentioned earlier, who serves as the antagonist uh, for the heroes, uh, reoccurring and foiling their plots or rapid and unexpected plot progression. Um, you could go from slaying goblins for a farmer for five copper pieces a day uh, for a hard day's work to negotiating peace between empires and whose kings are also dragons. It gets a little weird sometimes. It, it, gets, it gets weird. Um, See, the thing about this is that the, pace, the pacing of the game is very special in that players will often get very attached to their characters because they kind of grow up with them and, and earn experience in the game as the players earn experience with these characters. And something like this happened to me um, it, when I was playing last year. I had this character who was very Darwinian in his view of the world. He believed that the fit survived and the unfit did not, and that was the way things went. As what happens with most first-time characters at low levels, this character was killed very early on. Uh, however, he was given the chance to be resurrected from the dead. Now, I remember sitting here thinking about how this would happen, and realizing that while me, Calder, really liked this character, I wanted to see where he would go, I wanted to bring him back, but I realized that this character, because of his moral philosophy, wouldn't have wanted that. He would have seen himself as unfit, and he would not choose to return. So quietly, I, I denied the resurrection and let my first character slip into the afterlife. And at that point, I realized that there really was no option at all. You see, the character had transcended the player, 
And I was sitting there, I realized that I was not thinking of this character as something made up in my head. I was seeing him as a collection of experiences with his own opinions and his own worldview and his own moral philosophy. And at that point, I realized that while this was happening, I almost felt as if I was sitting watching this character make this decision instead of being the one making it myself. So, the, we, we've seen how, like, there's a very unique connection with the, the player character and the, uh, the character itself. Um, there's a bunch of themes that really tie in nicely to uh, Dungeons & Dragons that kind of mirror the world we live in today. Uh, there are elements of racial divisions where uh, half-orcs and tieflings and goblins are met with fear and mistrust by their human and elven counterparts. There are elements of class divisions where a, a world with nobility and kings uh, who are disconnected from their constituents really drives a, a sense of disenfranchisement. Mm -hmm. One of the most important themes that comes into this game, however, is consequence. And it, Dungeons and & Dragons and its players have a very interesting relationship with consequence in that everything that happens happens in their own theater of the mind and the collective imagination of the group. So this gives people the chance to experiment with certain situations and how they would handle them and see how things work out. And this, there's an example of this happened uh, quite recently to me in my uh, weekly Sunday night game. My party was investigating the trafficking of illicit magical drugs within a city called Yartar. And we were tipped off that we might be able to get some information from a character named the Water Baron. Now, we were speaking with this Water Baron, and he wasn't really giving us what we were looking. We tried to take the honest route, as most adventuring parties you know, start off doing. Uh, but he, we weren't really getting what we wanted, so we thought, okay, we need to get a little bit more aggressive here. So my character stepped forward. Now, backgrounder, this character has some magical abilities that let him control, among other things, the four elements. So he stepped forward and pulled out a tankard, which is like a big medieval cup. And he cast the spell, create water into it. And what happened was this tankard began overflowing as 10 gallons of water were created within it simultaneously. And he stepped forward and he said, look, looky here, water baron. If you don't give us the information we want, if you don't tell us what we're looking to hear, I'm going to create fresh water for all the people of Yartar and give it away for free and ruin your livelihood. And in my mind, I was being incredibly smart and very creative and very intimidating. I didn't expect to be met with laughter. Because, see, while I had assumed that the water baron had control over the drinking water supply of this town, it turns out he actually had control over the waterways that ran through it and by extension much of the local trade. And I was sitting here being laughed at by my enemies and my friends and honestly laughing at my own ignorance. I realized that I had taken zero time to prep anything for this encounter. I asked him no questions. I didn't uh, ask anybody what his deal was. And I frankly probably didn't pay very much attention when he was speaking. Um, and in that way, by taking that chance, I realized I learned something. I learned that I need to prepare for these types of situations or there will be lasting consequences. That being, we've had to interact with that character on more than a few occasions since, and he has never taken me seriously since that situation happened. So you might be thinking, okay, that's a funny story in a world far off in our own imaginations. How does this apply to me in any way? So I want, you to, ch I want to challenge your imagination. We're going to play a bit of D&D here, just in a different kind of setting. Instead of this being the water baron that Caller was interacting with, this is the interviewer. You were going for a job interview, and just like Caller, you could go in knowing only the title of the position you want and try to charm your way in. Like, I'm sure we've all tried. Um, but he runs a really high risk of misinterpreting the situation and making himself look like a fool. So, you know, after Sunday night game, he could wake up on the Monday and think, like, Okay, I, I know the title of the position I want. Maybe I should do some prep work. Like, maybe. So I, you know, get, actually get the job. So it's these kinds of lessons that we hope to subtly pass on through the games that we run for high school students in Guelph. Ultimately, when it boils down, RPGs can act as a simulation of reality taking place in a fantastical realm. They play with the idea of morality, of stability, um, both personally and societally. Um, 
you know, they can, they can help people explore things like classism and racism and all these things that are very complex issues can be simplified and uh, better understood through this game. Going beyond the game table, we hope to bring these lessons to young people through our work with the Bards College and by extension, the greater population because we believe that these lessons are important to learn and can be learned through this medium of tabletop role playing. So another element that I like to add to my storytelling is, and then by extension of Dungeon Master, I like to add complex moral situations into the story. Uh, by, give, by introducing this other brick into the storytelling structure, you, you, you add a, a, like a layer of depth to it that not a lot of things can explore in such a safe manner. Uh, take this for an example. Your adventuring party enters a town, and uh, it is stricken with poverty, and crime rules the city. Uh, and you want to you know, re re reintroduce a sense of order. There's multiple ways that you could approach this. You could approach the nobility whose apathy who's, has long since driven this, uh, this discontent in the town. The, you, you, you get to self-evaluate how you feel about the rule of law, uh, nobility, class divisions. Or you could approach Vassaris Cartwright, the crime lord, and he'll, he'll happily enforce the laws, but if, he, if you get to look the other way for when he does his own shady dealings, this, this adds to the depth and l lessons that a person can learn through Dungeons and Dragons by self-evaluating how you feel about something and by extension your character feels something, about something, that you, you grow as a human and that's something we hope to pass on. So a good campaign can go on for years and while Nolan and I could stand up here for an equal amount of time and talk to you about how passionate we are for this game and the benefits it confers to those who play it, we have to come to a logical conclusion. So keep in mind that in the game, as in life, adventure is never far off. There's always going to be a dragon to slay, a presentation to give, and experience to gain. On behalf of the Bards College, we thank you for your time, and may the dice always roll in your favor.